Patata es serenísima. Votre Altesse Sérénissime, Votre Altesse Royale, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres, Your Serene Highness, Royal Highnesses, Dear Friends, au forum Welcome International Peace and Sport 2017, to the Highness, International the Forum of Peace and Sport 2017. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, 2017 International Peace and Sport Forum. And it's my honor, my pleasure to welcome the President and Founder je voudrais accueillir le président et fondateur de Peace and Sport, M. Joël Bouzou. Monseigneur, Majesté, Your Highness, Altesse, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres, chers présidents ministers, de la Fédération internationale, dear International chers partenaires de Peace and Sport, dear partners chers champions de la paix, sport, dear champions for peace, chers amis, ladies and gentlemen, dear vous pouvez imaginer l'émotion qui est la mienne au début de ce dixième forum international de Peace and Sport. Même pour un court instant, je ne peux évidemment m'empêcher de regarder en arrière pour mesurer le chemin parcouru depuis nos premiers pas. I look backwards and I see how much. We have done so far. At the beginning, it was everything but obvious. Having a forum dedicated to this cause was utopia. But implementing concrete actions with the help of dedicated and available top-level athletes and champions was a huge challenge. We did encounter difficulties. We did have, however, a lot of progress made. And I am grateful. I'm grateful to the one without whom nothing would have been possible, the boss of our organization, His Highness Prince Albert II. Your Highness, Je profite de l'occasion qui m'est donnée aujourd'hui de vous exprimer mon profond respect et ma reconnaissance to tell you how grateful I am for the constant, consistent support that you have provided us. You have advised it in its evolution, and you've helped us in difficult times. Thank you on behalf of everyone who year after year came to the Principality of Monaco to come here in this forum and feel as a family member here. This is where the heart of sport through, a peace through sport movement beats. And you're part of it, my, your highness. And certainly it will be a pleasure for you and for all of us to see the important highlights of the 10 last years of the International Forum. Let's see together a few pages of this wonderful book that is this adventure.
des images qui marquent. These des images qui défilent. Are important. En 10 ans, nous avons accueilli plus de 5 000 faces, participants, de 5, participants from 110 countries. I would like to pay tribute to them wherever they may be today, because they have made this forum a forum of discussion where we meet every year and we become a great family all together. I would like to thank all those that are anonymous who act on the field with suffering populations, with resources that are very scarce and who help the people to try to get out of their des terrible milliers, situation and to give them hope. This is a way to get the light at the end of the tunnel. I am very happy to see the representatives of prestigious CEO, international UNESCO, organizations such as UNESCO, ICO, the Council UNHCR, of Europe, UNHCR, international federations within UNHCR, the framework le, of a partnership uh, with the UNHCR, we have a Live Together program, and especially with the International Table Tennis Federation in, jo in Jordan. Human being, being traffic is, is unfortunately widespreading everywhere, but we use our best endeavors to try to make the human being being respected. The day before yesterday, the Secretary General of the UN had an important, important words with regard to what happened in Libya, where people are tortured and sold as slaves. We'll have the opportunity to talk about it during the first session of the morning. Je tiens aussi à souligner la présence I would like de also Talib to Rifai, highlight the presence of Talab Rifai, Secretary General of the World Tourism Office, who chose this morning the, the theme of peace. Nous comptions également sur la présence de Madame Fatma Samoura, and Secretary Fatma, General de la FIFA, the Secretary General of FIFA, who unfortunately couldn't come because of family impediments. De la coopération à développer We count on the cooperation with one of the uh, most the popular vein, sports in the world. I'm particularly pleased with the quality of the ties established with the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates Permanent Secretariat. During its 16, 16th world edition in Bogota, I saw similarities between our approaches to promote lasting peace. I would also like to recognize the presence of three head of states here today and various representatives of governments ministers, ambassadors, representatives of international organizations or national institutions, local stakeholders, NGOs, and business representatives. The renewed interest that these decision makers have shown in peace and sport activities is for me the best evidence that we are on the right path. They must know that myself and the entire team are ready to make this forum both enjoyable and useful. The forum should expand to other sectors, particularly artistic production. For this purpose, we have planned a session dedicated to this item, and I would like to take this opportunity to send a wink to the artists in the room, Plantu, Faro, Roll Bradstock, and C215. In 10 years, we have worked a lot. We have made mistakes and got disappointment but we have also gained experience, generated power, developed a partner's network, and finally achieved to create a peace through sport community, which has started really to make a difference. The proof lies in the growing success year after year of April 6, the hashtag white card project, which has become the symbol of the movement of sport for development and peace. This year, it involved 43 million people worldwide, and it was promoted by state leaders, Nobel Peace laureates, major clubs, top-level athletes, international organizations. The white card effect was even able to bring together two teams from North Korea and South Korea as part of a sporting event. Further proof of the increasing power of the peace through sports community is the growing success of the Peace and Sport Watch, 
the digital platform launched in 2015 in partnership with Agence France Presse, which offers neutral and ongoing access to an exchange of information and expressions on international peace through sport news. Beyond these initiatives, we have made good use of these 10 years to strengthen beliefs which have developed during discussions and projects. I would just like to refer to some of them briefly, as I will have the opportunity during the award evening ceremony to be more precise on these elements. And these elements are the pillars of peace and sport action and should help us launch new initiatives in the future. More than ever, we are convinced of the universal value of sport as a neutral language, which can create dialogue and stability and as a powerful tool for diplomacy. A few months ago, I visited the President of Colombia, His Excellency Juan Manuel Santos, 2016 Nobel Peace Laureate, and I saw how sport, used very specifically, can be the cement which holds together a country after a damaging civil war. On April 6, Peace and Sport helped organize a women's basketball match between girls from FARC held territories and a Colombian civilian team. More than ever, we are convinced of the exceptional strengths of our champions for peace. They are committed, high-level athletes that spread the values of sport for peace. There are nearly 40 people attending this forum today who are ready to discuss this with you and help you understand the key values of peace and sport. In 2009, 35 athletes were announced as champions for peace. Today, they are a group of over 90 high-level sportsmen and women of different nationalities who demonstrate that sport goes beyond sporting performances and plays a genuine role in serving society. Thanks to them and their action, more than ever, we are convinced of the impact of field initiatives to reach populations and communities and make them aware that the language of sport can help them change their future. The peace through sport cause is challenging, and it requires us to continue to work closely with those who have been given a little hope and for whom sport is often their only source of social promotion, the only chance to change their future. For them, for our partners, for all those who are aware of what directly or indirectly affects humankind respect, we have a duty of innovation and we must continue to forge new paths to better respond to their needs. It is with this in mind that we have developed the Sport Simple Solutions concept, which allows everyone to take part in sport, wherever they are and regardless of whether they have access to usable equipment or materials. The only limit in expanding their numbers is our creativity. I am particularly happy to see an increasing number of international federations today interested in getting involved in this vision. And this vision goes to the very heart of sport. We must go further. That's why we have chosen as a theme of this tense forum, sport innovation for social transformation, in order to pinpoint and unlock adapted solutions that will, in return, transform societies and leave a sustainable legacies for, for generations to come. In this respect, this forum aims to trigger a new way of thinking to have a long-term effect on the wider world. It is up to you now to contribute with your ideas and thoughts and help us to make sport an investment for the future. Thank you all for your attention. Merci, merci, President. Thank you very much. Dear friends, before we get to the first session, I would like to uh, invite you to get the app of Peace and Sport. Get it on your smartphone. It's a Peace and Sport app. Then you will be able also to ask questions to all the panelists during uh, the, the forum. So please do so. And also you will vote for the NGO of the year. They're waiting for your vote. 
NGOs are here in the room. I'd like to know who you want to elect. So please do so. Presentation will be made in French and in English. You have, of course, headsets to, uh, to get the translation, so use them. Thank you very much. Let's get now to the first session. And to present the first session, it's my great pleasure to welcome my dear friends from Canada, five times Olympian, a great 408 meter, 800 meters runner. She's here with us, as always. Please welcome Charmaine Crooks. Charmaine. Good morning. The floor Good morning, is yours. Mark. How are you? Good morning. It's so wonderful to be here on the 10th anniversary and to hear the opening words of our president. And they certainly resonate for the last 10 years. And there's so much more to come. Your Serene Highness, it's a pleasure to always see you. And thank you again for being our, our great patron. And along with the, um, with the champions for peace who are here, we are such so excited to help deliver to you some amazing sessions today that will continue to challenge us for the next 10 years and beyond. So we begin this session on social innovation in changing times. So just what is social innovation? Well, they're novel ideas with the capacity to truly address the social needs that traditional policies and resources may not necessarily be able to tackle. This session truly visualizes the future global challenges that we face ahead and also provos, provo, um, proposes innovative solutions to change the rules of the game and create new ways to face the geopolitical and economic situations and also to help allocate to the benefit of sport and society. So, to begin this session, we go now to a pre-recorded video which will help set the theme for the rest of this session. So please welcome, on screen, we have Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Sport has an unparalleled ability to transform, empower, and unify people. Involvement in sport teaches ambition, perseverance, and teamwork. The United Nations is committed to harnessing the power of sport. Sport can be a driver of innovation to promote education, health, and the sustainable development goals. In this spirit, I welcome the efforts of the Peace and Sport International Forum. Congratulations on your 10th anniversary. I wish you many more successful years of bringing people together. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. It's uh, a great honor to have this uh, Thanks for the uh, peace and sport work. I wanted to add something. There will be after each session, we'll have a cartoon. We have a drawings made by Faro. Faro is a well famous French cartoonist. I uh, began drawing for sport, publication, the group Actu Foot, Les Cahiers du Football, L'Equipe Mag, France Football, is here today to show his, through uh, images, some of the messages of the sessions. Some will be to summarize. Some will be also to make you smile, because it's, we need to be very positive on different, on different ways. I think it's great to have the great artists here, so uh, this is a, a fantastic addition. So we welcome now our first speaker, Liliam Turam, president of Liliam Turam Foundation. Of course, we know him as an international former footballer. He created his foundation, Education Against Racism Foundation, in order to convey into actions his personal commitment against discrimination for equality. Please welcome Liliam Turam. And also World Cup winner with France right. in 1998 and uh, 2002, 2000 as a European champion. Here is Lilian Thuram. Bonjour Lilian. Welcome. C'est un plaisir. So we switch to French. On va passer au français. So use we your headset to, French to now, get the so translation. Lilian, c'est un bonheur de t'avoir ici avec nous. On va poser une us. première question. First question. Pourquoi avoir créé cette fondation Why did you create that foundation against racism? We can imagine that the issue is very serious. And how has sport helped you? 
First of all, hello to everyone. I would I like to say that this issue is not that serious. We might think that it's uh, complicated to talk about sport. We, we are not born racist. We become racist. You all know that children do not say right away, I don't like that guy or that girl. And I reflected upon it because I was born in Guadeloupe in 1962. I went to Paris in, uh, at the age of nine, and very often I, be, I said that I became black at the age of nine, because we become not, uh, black in a way, and we become white, but we don't know it. When I was told I was black, the image that I was uh, reflected to was uh, a very negative one. There was a stupid cow in the cartoons, and I wondered, and I asked my mother, why do we have such a negative image of black people? And her answer was very bad. They said, people are like this, they're racist, and it won't change. And I questioned myself. I wondered, why does racism exist. Well, that's the fruit of history, slavery, hierarchy between people depending upon the color of their skin. And people grew up like this. And in a natural way, they integrated some kind of view and perception. And if we want to understand racism, we have to understand sexism, because the oldest hierarchy is the one between men and women. Because for many, many years, since the dawn of times, we have always explained to men that they were superior to women. And what is interesting to me when we talk about racism is to understand how we can change our way of thinking. A woman knows she's a woman because she's reminded since she was uh, young, but a man wouldn't ask himself the question, he's a male, he's dominant. And same thing for the color. Because I ask myself a lot of questions, I would call a friend, tell me, I would ask him, do you feel that you're white? No, he would answer, but I'm black. If I'm black, what are you? But I'm normal, would he answer. And this is what is interesting, is that it's important to know where we talk from, to understand where we talk from, to see how changes can be operated, because we can question the present to criticize and improve things. Education that we receive is to reproduce schemes. You are educated as being a Muslim religion, Catholic religion, Jewish religion, and we reproduce patterns de hierarchy et en of hierarchy, and generally when we're educated un, un group, in a group, group you, you defend jamais. that group, you never criticize it, and as far as I'm concerned, it's important to have that type of education, and when I talk about education, I think it's important to show si that map. I don't know if you see that map. Oui, Do you see this map? Okay. Et très souvent, and very often, there's someone in the room who has put it upside down, has said put it upside down. Well, it's just to show you that the Earth is round and we could approach it in any way. And if we keep on looking at it in the same way, we think that there's no other way of approaching it. And this is what it is. Racism is all about this. It's a matter of landmarks. It's a matter of education. I don't know if we could show again the first video. Is it possible? Is it possible to show the first small movie? A very short movie. I would like to look at it. Because I think I saw something which is important. Okay, we'll react upon that. In the meantime, as we are trying to uh, overcome the technical challenge, has sport helped you or not? Well, yes, sport has helped me. Because when I started in uh, living in the Parisian region, the first time that I was not judged by the color of my skin was because of sport. Because you're asked to come as you are. And if you are good in your sport, then you're asked to play. If you're not good at your sport, then you're left aside. 
And I could travel as well. I could go in different countries, meet different football players, and also get to know other cultures, yes. Very often we see that the country in which we are we always feel that they are the center of the world. And we have to do as we, everybody should um, do as we do. We should decentralize ourselves and try to put ourselves in other people's shoes. But we don't do it because we are educated in a community, in a nationality. And we tend to defend our nationality and never to criticize it. And I come from the Antilles, and I wonder, how should we build peace? This is my question. And for, first of all, the first question we should ask ourselves is why are there wars? And I understood as a child that slavery, well, we think it's a hierarchy of people depending upon skin, but it's a business, first of all. Slavery was interesting at first for people who would sell. Because what did they sell? They, sell, they sold men. And we, they had to own human beings, and the future generations have to understand that they use commodities, they use human beings or commodities that they want to acquire. And so we ask two religions to fight, two nationalities to fight, but we have to understand what is the underpinning message behind that. So this is something that you have discovered, and you talk about education. Can sport help through education? Well, sport helps you have trust in yourself, have self-confidence. To progress, you need to have the capacity to understand that you can make mistakes. And with sport, we can have emotions. I often talk to my children and I, talk, and I tell them, you know, we are not people of reason, we are people with emotions. Why is sport interesting? Because you will share happiness and by sharing happiness with other people, there will be a link that will be woven between the two of you. And in this way, we don't fall into the trap of violence. We create pleasure. That means that sport is globally appreciated because we are human beings with emotions and the most important emotion is happiness, of course. Smiling, doing things together. The question is, what could we do to get things together? We can't live on our own. We have to live with other people. And this is why I think that sport is an extraordinary means to get people closer on an emotional level. Of course, this doesn't avoid all conflicts, but this can open dialogue with these people who sometimes killed each other. Well, it can also build a collective state of mind, something we're not aware of. You can have people of different nationalities, different colors. You tend to... With sport, you forget about your own. You, you get closer to people. And I can see it when I have used sport to educate my children. Once I was in Central Park, I was playing football with my children, and I told them, in one second, you're going to see the power of football. You're going to see. And so we pass the ball. People want to play. They come in. Others, and we ended up doing a, a, a huge game with people from different nationalities, different gender, different uh, religions. And I told you, this is the power of sport. This creates emotions and links and connections. It connects people. And this is important because we get closer. We discuss around the table. We can do sport. We can exchange to recognize ourselves as being human beings, first of and foremost. Because very often, we identify ourselves with features that are not that important. Nationality, sexuality, 
color of your skin, religion, it's not that meaningful. What we have to develop within human beings, and especially children, is the capacity to identify yourself as a human being. Why don't we do it? Because we uh, are uh, having in our mouth the speech and values that are being uh, transmitted to us by other people. And this is very political, because other politicians who say that, well, I was a football player for the French national team, but before asking the politicians to do something, we have to try to talk with the public at large. And this is how fortunate I am, because I can do so, because the public can have, can exercise some pressure on the political world. Freedom, equality, fraternity have to be worn. They're not given. They're not granted. They're not to be taken for granted. And we have to educate the mass that the society in which we live, we can change it. And very often, it's a minority of people who try to push the people upwards to change the society. And we have to do so. It's a wonderful thing to be here today because we are thinking about that. How could the society be better? How could we improve it? Today is through sport. And it's a great thing that people are thinking about it. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you for this testimony. We don't have any news about the video. Just to wrap up. On that movie, I think that there were two groups of children. There was one of Asian uh, origin with Roberts, another black children, African, who were playing barefoot. And uh, running after a wheel. And this is interesting to show why we chose these images, because this strengthens stereotypes. The African child is barefoot and runs. But you know, uh, I often go to Africa, and you also have African children playing with robots and working and playing with the PlayStation. Okay. On a les images. Ça, c'était le lancement de. C'est parti. Bon, si je me suis trompé, attention. Non, c'est pas ça. Ça, c'était l'ouverture, voilà. Non, c'était pas ça. Il y a un rouge. Oui, c'est pas, pas ça, c'est pas ça. C'est pas, pas ça. C'est pas celle-là. Okay, c'est pas celle-là. C'est la, okay. la toute première, mais c'est pas grave. Voilà. C'est intéressant. Les images, effectivement. Merci beaucoup, Lilian. Thank you, Merci. Lillian. Merci, Merci. Thank Merci. you. Charmaine, the floor is yours. Là, c'était celle-là. That was the one. That one. Voilà, c'était celle-là. Voilà, C'est Magnifique. <laughs> Bien vu. Merci. Thank you. Well Thank seen. You. Good. We move now to a few mini TED Talk style talks that you'll be able to experience this morning. And the first one will be with Rosella Pagliucci Lor, who is the Director of External Relations at the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. Please welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. So here we are to talk about refugees. 2016, the Olympic, uh, a team enters the Olympic Stadium in Rio de Janeiro, and it's carrying not a national flag, but a flag of uh, uh, um, the, the International Olympic Committee. Let's see if that works. I think I'm going to need a bit of technical assistance because I wanted to show you the pictures, actually. Oh, yes, there, there they are. OK. So there they are. And these are a group of young people united not by nationality, but, oh dear, well, but by the, uh, but by the fact that the common experience of having had to flee to save their lives. The refugees who came in and also, uh, they also had a shared experience of having, of having uh, well, it seems to be going by itself, uh, by the fact of having had, having had some of their most, most important athletic successes outside the sporting arena. They were the uh, Yusra Mardini, 
uh, Syrian swimmer plunged into the waters of the, of the Mediterranean to pull the boat with 20 people on board, and she pulled it along with her sister to safety. She swam for over three hours to do so. Yolanda, Yolanda uh, Manila fled as a 10-year-old while her village was being attacked, and in the chaos lost her family. She flew for three days through the bush until a kindly stranger picked her up and took her to a camp. The, the crowd that was cheering them on saw them for what they were, young people who had overcome incredible odds to be there. They didn't see them as job stealers, as people who had come to steal, to, do to, to dodge, and to, uh, and to take advantage of our welfare system. They didn't see them as security threat. They saw them for the extraordinary young people they were. They were refugees. They are refugees still. And let me give you a little bit of context of what a refugee is. There are in the world today about 67 million people who have been forced to leave their homes. Two-thirds of them remain within their own countries. We call them internally displaced. About the other third, about 22 million of them, have fled crossing borders, and that makes them refugees. Contrary to what we are hearing sometimes, it is not true that refugees are all trying to come to Europe. About 86% of them remain in neighboring countries in the global south, and often living alongside populations who already have very little access to services. Uh, refugees are also no longer frequently, uh, no longer mostly living in camps. Uh, it, following the general trend towards urbanization, more and more refugees are now living in urban areas alongside the, uh, the local poor uh, or in settlements. Finally, uh, let me also say something else, that while humanitarian budgets have been growing constantly, they just cannot meet the needs. And while the combined effect of humanitarian assistance, uh, local communities' uh, generosity, and the refugees' own resourcefulness means that, by and large, nobody dies, the reality is that today, a refugee Somebody who becomes a refugee today looks at about 20 years as a refugee. This is a very important statistical number. Because it means that, for example, a child's future is be, will be wasted away in a situation in which there are no real prospects for future. And this is perhaps the worst that can be said about the refugee experience. is the fact of being stuck in a kind of a twilight zone without prospects for future. So, children are particularly uh, vulnerable to this. Many of the children that we are seeing today are children who have been, uh, um, who have been, uh, who have been witnesses or directly, uh, directly victims of uh, extreme violence, children who have, who have witnessed their parents being killed, uh, children who have seen their world being upended. Many of them are deeply traumatized. Um, children are also in exile. They live the constant anxiety of seeing their family struggle and having a keen sense of their own future slipping away. Think that uh, refugee children have far less access to education than the normal, refugee popu uh, the normal population. Only about six out of ten have access to primary education and only two out of 10 have access to secondary education. If we talk about tertiary education, of course, the number goes even lower, maybe one out of 100. So, despite all of that, and let's see if I can get this to work, uh, despite all of that, the uh, refugee children are incredibly resourceful. And wherever you are, after a while you will see kids play. Whether it is, uh, uh, you know, using the side of a, of a tent as a slide, or building, or building toys, or creating other opportunities for entertainment. But sport brings a different dimension, and this is what we are talking about here. Sport is, if you wish, organized play, and it comes with benefits that cannot be replicated by uh, by spontaneous uh, play. Let me tell you about Dadab. Dadab was, about 15 years ago, I was in Kenya. And Dadab was then, like today, the largest 
refugee camp in the world. In those days, it was even bigger. Today, it's about 200,000 people. So what is it? About five times the population of Monaco. And uh, uh, the, the population in a, is mostly Somalis. Uh, the, it's a, con a rather conservative society that, as, is, as it is often the case, becomes even more conservative in exile. The, uh, one of the challenges that we had was trying to persuade families to send children, uh, girls to school and to keep them there. Because, of course, refugee girls are overprotected, but also because uh, since childhood they have to help their families. One of the things that came up was the question of sport. Well, the girls certainly did want to have sport activities, but the community didn't think it was really quite appropriate. We had incredible uh, lengthy negotiation with the various groups, uh, you know, imagine sitting 48 degrees, uh, you know, in, uh, in the camp, trying to persuade them that this was good for the girls. Finally, we managed to uh, whittle down the objections to what they should be wearing, and tracksuit did not seem to be an acceptable uh, get-up for, for the girls. So what you see there is a bespoke, is bespoke sports um, gear that was developed with the assistance of Nike. Uh, they w it consists of uh, a head covering and an ankle-length tunic with trousers underneath. The, uh, the tunic has a coulisse, which allows, it to be, allows the skirt to be hitched up, as you see with the girl who is wearing the white one at the back, so that they can run. And of course, we also had to provide a, a complete cover around so that boys couldn't see the girls playing. A rather complex arrangement, but it has allowed the girls to play. And now, years later, I'm told that there are regular leagues girls' leagues in sport in the dub, and the softball team is doing really well. And the parents, and that's more important, take pride in the achievements of their daughters. So this is a way in which sport has allowed the girls to crack that door a little bit more open. Think about societies in which girls are being taught from early childhood to be self-effacing and invisible. And think about the mindset change that comes when girls are taught to stand tall and hit that ball with all their strength. It's more than sport. It's really a, a mindset change. Sport does something else. Sport provides structure, provides predictability. Many children need predictability and structure to grow. But refugee children have often seen the world completely, the world becomes incomprehensible when your world is completely broken down by violence and by the, the experience of having to leave everything you know. Yolanda, who fled, the, the girl who fled uh, for three days in the bush, got, when she got to the camp, met with someone who was giving judo lessons. She says that judo saved her. Because lost as she was, having lost her family, being among strangers, imagine a little kid, I can't imagine myself, 10 years old and running for three days on my own. And when she did, she found someone who took her under his wing, taught her judo, and judo became for her that center, the ground, the foundation upon which she was able to rebuild her life. So, and finally, Sport is also what builds community, what makes groups into teams. It provides that sort of sense of belonging that many refugee children lose, uh, miss. Don't forget that uh, even when you, are in a, when you have crossed the border and you are supposedly in safety, well, safety has different shades. And for example, in refugee camps, very often, uh, refu uh, families end up living with uh, uh, cheek to jowl with communities that are not their regular neighbor, they're not their uh, accustomed neighbors, sometimes even hostile communities. You, there's a lot of negotiation that has to take place uh, to, to ensure, to ensure uh, cohabitation. Or when they live with uh, local communities, uh, local communities are both generous and welcoming, but sometimes also resentful because refugees are seen as coming and competing for resources that are already very scarce. So the opportunity of sport activities that bring together youth from the refugee and the local community are extremely valuable. They're a way of building, again, the fabric of a community that, uh, that can function in a peaceful manner.
Um, we believe, uh, we strongly believe at UNHCR, the refugee agency, that all children should have access to education and to sport. That is really the, the necessary complement of a good child development. Um, as it is, of course, the sport is only available to a very small number of kids, uh, perhaps 10%, maybe. But there are good news. And the good news are that, first of all, last year, in 193 states came together and made a formal commitment in New York to look at refugee crisis in a somewhat different manner by focusing on solutions from the beginning, so trying to cut that sort of those 20 years, uh, and to support local communities alongside the refugee community, linking up humanitarian assistance and development. The idea is a whole of society approach in which not just the usual suspect, the UN, the NGOs, but also civil society, association, sport association, um, private sector, business, all come together to try and bring about an overall improvement for the life of all the community, local and the refugees together. And in so doing, giving greater possibility for self-reliance and for a more meaningful life, access to services, access to education to everyone. There is a growing, and there is a growing interest by the, uh, by the, in the sport world to engage with, refugee in, with refugees. There is a growing understanding at large that sport isn't just about records, but it is about something much more substantive and much more deep in terms of uh, education and full development of the person. We have uh, growing partnerships. Well, peace and sport is one, but there are others. There are various federations that are working with us. And of course, the International uh, Olympic Committee that is just in these days launching a foundation called Refuge that will aim to assist, uh, to, to bring sport to refugee children and other marginalized kids. So, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a lot of work to be done. Of those 22 million refugees that I mentioned, well over half are kids. So there's a lot of work to be done, but it can be done. It can be done and we can together help give these kids a better future for themselves and for the communities of which they are part. And I do hope that you will want to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rosella. That was, that was amazing. Our next speaker is Irina Bokova, former Director General of UNESCO. Irina is, um, was, a, was the Director General of UNESCO from 2009 till 2017, and during her political and diplomatic career in Bulgaria, she served, among others, two terms as a member of the National Parliament and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Foreign Affairs ad interim. Please welcome Irina Bokova. Thank you very much, uh, Shermin, for this uh, very kind uh, presentation. Uh, Monsignor, uh, my dear friend uh, Joel, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy to be here to celebrate. Uh, I'm happy to celebrate uh, the 10th anniversary of Peace and Sport. A, uh, I would say one of the best partners of UNESCO when we speak about uh, sport and uh, peace and sustainable development. And I'm here because I think we are all are passionate about sport. Because sport is this vehicle that brings about social inclusion, that brings about peace, mutual understanding, that fights prejudices, that is uh, a vehicle for self-esteem, for a better understanding of the others, for human rights and for human dignity. And I say this because of my eight years at the helm of UNESCO, the United Nations Agency that is responsible for leading the education agenda, but not only. We work in gender, we work in uh, youth, uh, we work in the intercultural dialogue. And I have noticed by myself uh, visiting uh, many countries, uh, refugee camps, and I'm very uh, happy that Roussel is here to share the experience of the uh, agency for, for refugees. I have seen the power of sport. And sport is not just physical education. Sport, as I said, 
is about inclusive communities and inclusive societies. Now, when the United Nations were preparing and we were all working there in partnerships, the Sustainable Development Agenda to the year 2030, unfortunately, sport was not among the goals or the targets. But still, we have an opening. Sport is recognized as an enabler of sustainable development in the preamble of the Agenda 2030. So, we have it there. We wish it was more integrated into the 17 goals and 169 targets, but it was not the case. This does not prevent us from working and to seeing how sport contributes to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda, something that Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez just mentioned. And this is where I think our responsibility of all the partners lies. At least this was the responsibility and still is of UNESCO. Let me just remind you that UNESCO is leading a unique platform of ministers of sports. Some of you are here and some of you have been partners of UNESCO. The MINEPS conferences, the conferences of ministers of sports, they started in 78. When the first MINEPS conference was held, at that time, the Charter of Physical Education and Sports has been adopted. The second conference, MINEPS conference, established the committee, the CGEPS, the Committee on Sports and Physical Education. Then, we had also created the fourth a platform for the negotiations on the anti-doping convention. Then we had the Berlin conference four years ago when the charter was adapted, revised. And this year, in July, we had MINIPS 6, where ministers of sports once again adopted the Kazan plan of action. I say all this because we need these large platforms of discussions and debates with ministers, with the sports associations, with the global players, with civil society, with the private sector. We know that nowadays sports has become also a big business, but we should never forget that one of the main responsibilities is to make sports accessible. And that is why during these conferences of ministers of sports, the issues that have been discussed, which are in the Kazan Plan of Action, is first and foremost how to make sports accessible, how to integrate it in local communities, how to integrate it in schools, in education systems, how to create the necessary infrastructure, how to make governments, private sector, invest in sports, because investing in sports is investing in society, it's investing in communities. Then, of course, the big question is how to, as we say it in our bureaucratic language, mainstream sports, how to look at sports from all the 17 development goals. And we all know that it is so much related to education, to youth engagement, to social inclusion, to health, to achieve the health for all, to health benefits, to inclusive and peaceful societies. And this is where the contribution of this conference is so important. We need, of course, more data. We need more segregated data. We know it's very complex in order to see what are the investments in sports, but we have to be a little bit more elaborate in order to achieve this. And we need, of course, to look at the integrity of sport. All of these three big areas have been profoundly discussed and are integrated in the last Kazan Declaration. When we speak also about sport, and many of these issues have been raised here this morning, we are speaking about human rights, about equality, about anti-discrimination, and we were very proud at UNESCO to publish, to enter into partnership with Juventus to publish our report about racial discrimination in sports under the title Color, What Color? And this report helped us provoke and encourage many discussions in different groups, in sports clubs, among civil society groups, 
to raise the awareness of the media and others around this so important topic. And then, of course, is the big area about peace. We know that peace nowadays is a complex challenge because conflicts are different, because we see conflicts within societies, because we see refugees, and I'm very grateful to Rosella for providing all these good examples of how sports contributes to integrating refugee children and others. But there is another, I would say, global, bigger dimension. Unfortunately, we see that sports practices is declining in everywhere in the world, in developed societies, in developing countries. Children prefer to stay in front of the playstations than go to the playgrounds. And this is where we need partnerships. We need first to hold governments accountable. We need also to create platforms for sharing good practices, but we need also to mobilize very strong partnerships because sport is having a huge impact in Colombia, in refugee camps, in Zatar, in some other parts of the world. I have seen what sports contributes in South Sudan, in the Central African Republic, when we see teams from different backgrounds of young people playing together. But we need also to invest in sports, to look at the infrastructure and to look at the equity, accessibility and quality of sports. This is also where another aspect so important comes into the picture. It is about women and girls in sports. We all know that unfortunately, girls are not encouraged they are not prevented, they are not enabling environments for girls in many settings to be engaged in sports activities. All bright, all bite, we have the Brighton Declaration adopted in 94 about women in sports. There were major conferences, gatherings in 2014 in Helsinki. There are champions, there is a special working group that contributes, but still it remains a huge challenge. So I think during this meeting, there will be a lot of discussions about women and girls in sports in different settings, formal, informal, and I encourage you to look at this also from the point of view of equity and equality. Because if in the Agenda 2030, the main objective is to leave no one behind, this is where I think sports is a cross-cutting issue as an issue that cuts all over and covers all the 17 development goals may play a hugely important role. And last, I do believe we are looking for leadership. We are looking for new partnerships. And I think the new leadership today is partnerships. And I would like to congratulate Peace and Sport, to congratulate for this 10th anniversary, to congratulate for this leadership, and for establishing this wonderful platform. And thank you once again, Monsignor, for supporting this so important global initiative to be the new leadership through this wonderful platform and gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Okay. Well, what would an innovation session be and what would this conference be without hearing the voice of youth. So please join me in welcoming two. Trishan Dash is a student from St. Lawrence High School in Calcutta, India, and he participated in Expression 2017, and he's just 10 years old. And we also have Stephanie Arboleda, a youngster from Colombia, coach and representative of Football Con Corazon. So welcome these young people to the stage. And here they are. Come on down, guys. <laughs> Hi, Trishan. How are you? Hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone. This is 
Trishan Das from St. Lawrence High School, Kolkata, India. Here is a picture I drew. But before that, let me explain you what inspired me to draw this. I was very depressed to see a war movie. I wondered, what if they never had to fight? Then no one would have died. It just came into my mind that the soldier who died in the movie might have a son like me. If it is true, I know how much the little boy is missing his dad. How can I stop a war? Was my question. After some days, Expression 2017 happened in my school, St. Lawrence High School, Kolkata. It was an event which highlighted and educated us about peace and sport and Olympic values through artwork. I wondered if sports could have saved the life of the soldier who died in the movie. Yes, we can. That's my strong belief. This is my picture is all about. First, two rival countries are fighting with each other with bombs and missiles. It's a war. Nobody seems to be happy. Now, it's even more dangerous. A fighter plane is approaching in the battlefield and the soldiers might be bombed which means more killing. But look, I have changed my script. The fighter jet is throwing footballs and not bombs and missiles. Look, what are the soldiers doing now? They threw away their arms and started to play football. Look, I'm not sure they speak the same language or not, but through sports, they are speaking so many things. So. Their family will be happy to see them safe. By the way, do you know who was flying the plane? It was me. I would like to thank all the people who brought Expression 2017 in my school and introduced peace and sport and Olympic values to us and other Jesuit schools all over the world. My stopping of war and dropping footballs could be imaginative, but my ideas, thoughts, and beliefs are real. I believe in peace, peace through sports. Do you? Maybe we can have Olympics for soldiers. Maybe we can have four into 100 meters lead a team of Indian and Pakistani soldiers who run against the mixed team of Israel and Palestine? What do you think? It is important to educate children about peace and sport and Olympic values, irrespective where they are, whether they have seen a war movie or not. They should know the art of maintaining peace and how could be sports the biggest tool for peace building. I know I have international people, Olympians, heads of states of Presidents of Sports Federation are sitting in front of me. We, children, have uh, many tournaments we follow, like uh, FIFA World Cups and other World Cups. In India, we follow Cricket World Cup. I have a request to all of you, to the decision maker of this great sporting event, that why can't each tournament promote a social message like Green Planet or anti-terrorism or no racism? I am sure it will create a great impact to the children all over the world who follow these tournaments. It will help them to become a better person and a good citizen in the future when they grow up in the world. I would like to finish my speech by saluting all of you who have come here because you believe in peace, peace through sports. That makes my belief even stronger. Thank you.
Gracias, Teresa, por ese excelente discurso. Eh, yo me llamo Thank you, Teresa. I'm Estefania. I eh, would like to say hello to all of you. Muy de cerca, I, eh, uh, el I know very well what uncertainty and discouragement is of having no security, no stability. Uh, in Colombia, we had a period of violence, and my family and I had to uh, be displaced because of the violence, and we had to go to Antioquia. And, uh, Uh, we leave Antioquia and go to Barranquilla, a city, a dangerous city. So we were in a zone where uh, that was very dangerous, and we had to build our house our, ourselves uh, with wood. And uh, that neighborhood was called Loma Roja. Uh, that means very dangerous. So when I was a little girl, I had to work uh, very early to help my family uh, because we had very few resources. Resources. So I had to start to work to help my father, my parents, my brothers and sisters. I felt despair. My father really uh, was hoping that he would be able to provide for us stability and a safe place. But unfortunately, he was not able to do that. And, uh, I had to, to go through very difficult moments. And I remember how sad it is uh, to live those circumstances where you have nothing, where you feel total despair because you know uh, that uh, this is your destiny. And I had trouble accepting this destiny. I had no opportunities. I was poor. And for me, it was difficult to accept this situation. But, uh, Later, uh, after a few days, my father died. Uh, he was sad when he died because he was not able uh, to provide a decent, a decent home for us, and he was not able to do that. And then, after his death, I had to work uh, to support my mother, my uh, brothers and sisters. So I had to, uh, to uh, work when I was 11 or 12 years old, and uh, I had a very a heavy uh, burden of responsibility on my shoulders. But I heard about an organization in my neighborhood called uh, Football with Heart. And I heard uh, that it was able, uh, possible to overcome uh, this lack of opportunities I was uh, stuck with. Uh, so I uh, was able, through this association, uh, to overcome the situation. But uh, I'm happy myself, but I'm thinking about all those young people in my country that are still in the situation I was in before. And this is uh, thanks to this organization that I was able to study. I, I could change my vision of my life. It changed my life forever. Thanks to Football with Heart, I was able to obtain a grant to study at the university. At the start, I was just a, a little girl being displaced. I, had, I never dreamt I could go to university. And I never thought I could go to the university and become I'm a professional. I was studying psychology, and thanks to that, I was able to understand life in general and the life of those uh, boys and girls in my situation, and I wanted to help them. I wanted uh, really to contribute to change uh, their lives. And psychology for that helped me a lot, and this is uh, uh, why it is so important to give one opportunity to those boys and girls from my country the, the way I had myself. And as a coach of uh, football, I had the opportunity of uh, giving back to those children what I received, that love for life, that happiness, that uh, uh, joy. Um, I want to give them that, but uh, uh, what is the most important for them is that they can believe their dreams can come true. When I was a little girl, I uh, went to this association, Football with Heart. I remember my coach. Uh, you know, I heard that organization had come to the neighborhood, and uh, I, wanted, I told him, uh, you know, I heard that they were not only accepting boys, but they were 
were accepting girls. And I was so deeply touched by that. And I wanted to go. And I went there and I told the professor that I'm coming here because I want to be someone in my life. And I always remember that moment. I was a, a tiny little girl then, but that changed my life. So sometimes uh, you see something, a tiny little thing that happens, and you don't know that that little thing will change your life. So I think uh, that ourselves, we can do a tiny little thing that will change the life of someone else. So in Colombia, uh, uh, the young people have a lot of enthusiasm, they have a lot of energy, uh, they uh, are ready uh, to do something to change the reality of uh, uh, society of the families. But all this we can't do alone. We need the cooperation of all of you here present. And I would like to take advantage of this particular moment uh, because uh, uh, there are uh, very uh, high um, personalities here, um, ministers and so on. So I think you can really uh, work in favor of world peace and we need your support. Support. And it is a key moment to continue in this direction uh, because we need uh, policies from the state uh, that uh, would include women, young people into sport. And this will help a lot to change the world. Thanks for you, uh, your attention. Merci. Thank you both. That was so amazing. So amazing, so inspiring. And, it, you know, Joel, you started by saying uh, light at the end of the tunnel. If there was a light at the end of the tunnel, it's these youth. Ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause Stephanie for these fantastic and presentations. Trisha. Thank you so much. Good job. You did a really good job. Congratulations. Thank so you very much. And good luck. Thank good you luck guys. for the rest. Okay? All right. We'll bye see, bye you later. see you later. <laughs> that was amazing. This is a great language. This is a great language. We have another one. It's the drawings. And let's see what Faro, how Faro saw this first session. We have the drawing. Refugees, don't leave us on the bench, of course. That's cool. Of course. We have to take care of everyone. That's something which is important. And we heard yeah, it this right. morning from loud our, and clear. our presenters. Absolutely, loud and clear. And this is something we need to really face. Uh, Nowadays, and we know that there is a terrible uh, also issue in Libya. Joel uh, talked about it, and we have to look what's going on over there, and maybe, maybe also uh, try to help uh, through sport for uh, having more dialogues over and more education. And the next sessions, we're going to talk more about the business side and look at some concrete solutions that we can continue to work and to build on. Of course, of course, but. First of all, I would love to say thank you to His Serenity. Je voudrais remercier encore une fois Merci. Son Altesse Serenissime, le Prince Souverain Albert II de Monaco. Merci encore pour avoir été avec nous ici à cette, thank you, à cette session. Thank uh, you for Ouverture being with us in this opening session of the 10th anniversary. anniversary. So now we go to coffee break? Yes, we'll have a coffee break. So stay in place, please. And uh, we say thanks to His uh, Serenity. On va remercier Son Altesse. Thank you, Monseigneur, for joining Merci, us. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Stay in place, stay in place for some minutes. Restez en place. Merci. Merci de votre attention. Il y a donc une pause d'une demi-heure. We have a coffee break for half an hour. So please be back in the room for the next session at uh, 11, not after. Thank you very much. Merci de votre attention. Thank you, Chairman.